Earthquakes, like none of the other hazards we consider, are at the cusp where the built environment impacts with nature. We'll approach earthquakes via four different key topics. The features of earthquakes, what sets them aside. We'll talk about the four main hazards which impact onto society. Talk about risk, how it varies on time and distance scales and then finally get back to this point of the critical nature of the interaction between the physical environment, the human environment, in terms of influencing whether an earthquake is a disaster or not. To drive home this point, that building structures are critical to our understanding of earthquake disasters, I want to show you a short video right at the start. This is quite central to me. It's my wife's home city of Christchurch in New Zealand, an earthquake in February 2011. That was huge. It's way bigger than the first one. And the whole of the fucking town's in panic. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Another major earthquake has struck, and this time people have died. The quake struck at 12.51 this lunchtime, nine minutes to one. Police have confirmed there are fatalities as well as many injured. It happened at the worst possible time during the lunch hour. A 6.3 magnitude earthquake, five kilometers deep and 10 kilometers southeast of the city. One of the buildings where rescuers are still trying to reach the trap tonight is the Pine Gould Corporation building. The press building behind the cathedral also collapsed. It's feared there are many people trapped in the collapsed CTV building. I've had so far is that 65 people have lost their lives. Um, we can't rule out death toll climbing from there. New Zealand may be staring down uh, with us at start. So the key characteristics of earthquakes that we'll explore are listed here. 
And I'll show you one slide for each of these. A violent magnitude 9.0 earthquake on March 11, 2011. The first is that unlike volcanic eruptions, we don't have useful warnings in the context of earthquakes. We can do two things. We can know that a certain fault line is accumulating stress, that there will be a problem, but it'll be sometime in the future, but we can't predict when that'll happen. We can often detect an earthquake early, and that will give a little warning, a few seconds to a few tens of seconds warning at distant locations. So for key facilities like the Japanese Shinkansen train, the bullet train, it has been possible to stop the train after the earthquake occurs, but before the damaging ground shaking reaches the train tracks. But it's of limited use. We do know where earthquakes occur. So here in the United States, there is a very, very clear delineation of earthquake hazard, particularly strongly in coastal Alaska, in Hawaii, and in a strip stretching from California through Oregon to Washington. So in that sense, you can adopt land use planning strategies, which permit much more rigorous building codes in these areas and lax codes elsewhere. You can also predict locally where the problems will be, where the fault line is and where the fault line crosses key infrastructure. And so you can strengthen weak links. The, the viaduct that you see on the freeway in the image on the left-hand side of the slide could be retrofitted, accepting that it's a prime target for uh, damage from the earthquake. The really large earthquakes, the ones that cause grave concern globally are very restricted in their distribution, and the bulk of them occur around the margin of the Pacific. You can see they cluster. There are places like Chile and Indonesia and the Aleutian Islands in Japan where the problem is always going to be acute. This is really the strong take-home message. It's buildings that kill people in earthquakes. It's not the earthquake itself. Engineering failures account for overwhelmingly the dominant loss of life from earthquakes, and that can be dealt with with retrofitting of structures, but retrofitting of structures is costly. And we'll return to this point a little bit later on. What level of risk do we need to insist upon costly retrofitting <coughs> measures? This is a striking example here of how engineering practice and building codes determine the level of damage from an earthquake. At first glance, this building appears to be essentially intact. However, once you look at it in some detail, you'll notice that the fifth floor from the bottom has gone. The fifth floor has been sandwiched and smashed in on itself. And this became known as the fifth floor problem because it reoccurred across many, many buildings, and they were typically 20 years or older, which collapsed in this earthquake in Kobe, Japan. Why was this? It was building codes. The old code permitted a weaker structure above the fourth floor. So the, the base at the bottom fourth floors remained strong and robust. Everything above them shook, and the fifth floor assume, um, assumed that problem. So what are the key consequences of those key characteristics? Well, we don't spend a lot of time in pre disaster mode for earthquakes. We make a transition immediately into the recovery mode. We have these very, very short warning times, but we do have the potential to strengthen weak points. We know where the high risk areas are. Within those high risk areas, we can look for where the lifelines are vulnerable. Building codes are the key to guarding against earthquake damage. But unfortunately, it's a complex equation. There are four different hazards, in fact, to consider. The first one, surface rupture, is actually very localized. So surface rupture is just the damage along the fault line itself. It's severe, but it's very, very limited in its distribution. <clears throat> in comparison, earthquakes shake the ground over huge areas. The footprint of ground shaking is enormous, and it varies with a number of different things. How big is the earthquake? A big earthquake will produce 
much more ground shaking. How shallow is the earthquake? A shallow earthquake is far more damaging than a deep one. And finally, just local conditions, just literally the properties of the soil on your <clears throat> property can influence whether or not you'll see damaging shaking taking place. So if we think about magnitude first, magnitude's an interesting concept because basically every time we jump up by a factor of one on the magnitude scale, we increase the amount of energy that's poured out 32 times. So it's not a simple doubling, it's much, much more than that. And so the difference between a magnitude 6 and a magnitude 7 earthquake is much more severe than we might initially imagine. What happens during a earthquake is typically the ground will fracture and that fracture will propagate outwards. This is a beautiful reconstruction of the propagation of the fault for the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. It's a reconstruction effectively across a time interval of about 10 uh, minutes and it just repeats itself. The colors tell you the intensity of the ground shaking. Notice that it's strongest at the south near Banda Aceh when it first starts right now. As it moves northwards, it becomes weaker. So the longer the fault, the longer it will continue to induce ground shaking and the more energy will be released. We have a different scale for earthquakes, which we call the intensity scale. Magnitude and intensity are quite different. Intensity, the so-called Macaulay scale, is based on the level of shaking, the level of damage. And so it doesn't automatically couple with the intensity. Under certain conditions, the intensity will be strongest away from the actual epicenter of the earthquake. This is the great um, 1902 earthquake in San Francisco. The star indicates the location of the earthquake. Red is the most intense ground shaking, and it's displaced markedly to the north, perhaps somewhere of the order of 30 to 40 miles north of the earthquake epicenter. Why is that? Simply where the damage occurred was in places where the ground was weak, where the shaking was stronger. It was in places where ground had been reclaimed, um, during urban development or, or in valleys where there was loose sediments. <laughs> Ground shaking is critical. Most of the damage and consequences of earthquakes are associated with ground shaking. It's particularly harsh on key infrastructure, on roads, on railways, on telephone and electrical supplies. <clears throat> Inside of buildings, Damage is largely caused by falling objects. Ground shaking will cause any loose objects to detach and collapse with the sorts of damages that you see in the images here. Linked to ground shaking is the potential that the subsurface soil will liquefy and lose its strength. And when that happens, then you basically will see crazy consequences, as you see in the diagram at the bottom right, where some apartment buildings are remaining standing, others have toppled, just depending on whether the soil has turned to liquid or not. This is a video from the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, we'll just watch the early part of it, that shows liquefaction taking place. Okay, we have earthquake right now, and this is actually moving. Can you see the cracks moving? That crack was not there. Nice. The whole earth is moving. I felt like I was drunk. I could see different parts. I could, ooh, wow. There was water just coming up right there in the ground. The ground is just swaying right now. I don't know if you can see this on video. The crack is getting bigger and smaller, going back and forth. And there is water coming up all over in the park right now. This
track is just moving. There's water. I don't know if water lines are broken, but this water was not there a minute ago. And then earthquakes, a hazard in their own right, spawn off other hazards. Secondary hazards, cascading hazards are linked to earthquakes as well. Um, landslides, fire, uh, damage to critical industry, all of these things can be linked back to a trigger by an earthquake. Kobe, um, the location with the fifth floor problem in the houses, saw 300 fires break out within minutes of the earthquake. It was caused by the fact that gas pipes were broken and then broken electrical cables triggered sparks that ignited the gas. Seven and a half thousand houses destroyed in large part because it was impossible for the first responders to get access into the sites. So our second theme is dealing with what is the variation in earthquake activity and earthquake risk with time and in space. In time, there's a strong relationship between the size of an earthquake and how frequently it will occur. Large earthquakes occur infrequently, small earthquakes occur all the time. So globally, we probably at best see one magnitude 8 earthquake a year, but drop down to magnitude 7 to 7.9, and we'll more likely see 15. And so it just increases as we go down to smaller and smaller earthquakes. This is good in the sense that many, many people are exposed to relatively small earthquakes and develop <coughs> protective um, reactions. Uh, it is a problem when a large earthquake happens. And if you remember, we looked very briefly at this diagram before. This is a diagram of the large and great earthquakes since the year 1900. And what you see is two spikes on the plot that correspond to the time interval centered on 1960, and then the time interval centered on about 2010. For a 20 year period, either side of those dates, there were a large number of great and near great earthquakes experienced, and there was a lull before and after. So the question at the moment is, are we at the peak in terms of large earthquake activity? as we sit today in 2015, or has that peak passed and are we going to drop back into another trough? In the United States, we are spared in large part the worst earthquakes. So we very seldom see magnitude 8 and above earthquakes, but in any given year, we may well see a magnitude 7 and we certainly will see quite a few magnitude 6s. So in time, we can predict that we will see magnitude 6. The biggest earthquakes ever on US soil are earthquakes associated with the Pacific margin. And you can see spread over a very long window of time here, a significant number of magnitude eight and even a couple of magnitude nine earthquakes. Uh, in terms of their impact, the deadliest earthquakes are not necessarily the strongest ones. So if you look here, this is simply a ranking of, on the basis of number of deaths uh, for our nine deadliest earthquakes. And only one of those is of magnitude nine. Only two, in fact, are greater than magnitude eight. Why is this? It's because the biggest earthquakes are not where the biggest concentrations of population are in large part. Where we, where we did see large, really large earthquakes causing high death toll, it was due to tsunamis triggered as a cascading hazard rather than the earthquake itself. More detailed map of where we've seen earthquakes larger than magnitude 5.5 in the last 111 years. Again, this very, very strong focus in three areas, Hawaii, Alaska in particular, and then the Pacific Northwest stretching down to California. One of the biggest issues for us and globally is what magnitude of earthquake should we take as our worst case scenario? If we're going to build to earthquake code, what should we build to? A one in 10 year event, a one in 500 year event, somewhere in between. 
What's interesting is there are regions around the Pacific, and this includes the Pacific Northwest, where on a time scale of a few hundred years, there are always magnitude 9 earthquakes. So clearly there, we have to weigh the value of what's at risk against the cost of retrofitting. Uh, and this is applicable to the Indian Ocean, it's applicable to Japan and to Chile, but of course also to Washington and Oregon. So coming to the last portion of, the, of this presentation, earthquakes are a combination of factors that relate, sorry, the impact of earthquakes are a combination of factors specific to the earthquake's dimensions, factors that relate to the conditions where the population is centered, and then aspects of society itself. So the energy release, the magnitude, the type of earthquake, its location, and particularly its depth, are all factors that are specific to the earthquake itself. Geologically, what we worry about is what is the soil like? Is it likely to be liquefaction? How close are we to the epicenter of the earthquake? But overwhelmingly, it's the bullet points in italics here which are critical. What's the quality of construction in the community that we uh, have placed at risk? What are the economic conditions? It's very, very interesting that the preparedness of the population strongly influences the consequence of the earthquake. And even time of day. In the video from Christchurch in New Zealand, they mentioned that the time of day was wrong. The time of day was 1 p.m. That was when the civilian population had come out on the streets to have lunch. And so falling masonry was responsible for a very, very large loss of life. In other places, a very early morning earthquake can be equally problematic. So what we want to deal with here is just those factors, those factors that we choose and we make decisions about relating to society, which impact on the uh, event. Construction standards and building codes, absolutely critical. I mentioned before that if there is no retrofitting, you are going to pay a price for it. The image on the right here is a shot of Kobe at the time of the 1995 earthquake that I've referred to before. And you can see three generations of buildings with three different responses. A brand new building, completely intact, undamaged at all. A building from the 1960s which collapsed at the fifth floor because of the building code issue that I raised before. And then a me traditional medieval home with a heavy tile roof and um, wooden construction completely destroyed by the event. In hindsight, the decision not to employ retrofitting in the traditional old town environment was what led to the large loss of life in that situation. In some places, there simply aren't building codes. The huge anomaly, and we'll see this in, on the next to final slide, I think in the context of um, earthquake activity is the Haiti earthquake in 2011. Huge damage from associated with the magnitude 7 earthquake in an environment where there were no building codes whatsoever. This image here is not an image showing damage after the earthquake. This is a pre-earthquake image showing the structure, the, the quality of construction. Economics plays a key role in terms of the scale of impact of earthquakes. Uh, in a first world setting, for example, if the economy is depressed, you have a very different level of resilience versus a situation of economic well-being. This is markedly the case with the string of earthquakes that we've seen in Japan over the last few decades. Also, um, impact has to be viewed in the context of the size of the economy. So in other words, the cost should be weighed, the dollar cost should be weighed against GDP. The Haiti earthquake was so damaging because its cost was 127% of GDP. Absolutely same sized earthquake in Northridge, California in 1994, 0.25% of GDP. Haiti has barely started to recover, whereas Northridge recovered, bounced back enormously rapidly. There's another way in which 
we can distort the impact and actually cause impacts to spread and become national or international, even when the ground shaking is more limited. And that is there's been a tendency in recent times to cluster together like industries. The notion that if you cluster car plants together, for example, <clears throat> there's an econ economics of scale that applies. Or if you cluster together silicon chip manufacturers, that's true until you see the size of the impact in a major event. So the Tohoku earthquake had a major impact on Japanese car sales globally. It caused a crisis in terms of production of computer chips just because a substantial portion of the Japanese economy in those two sectors was located in the area that was directly affected in Tohoku. Our third social factor relates to the human population itself. As in all disasters, there are subsets of the population who are peculiar at risk on the grounds of age or race or ethnicity, special needs, the uh, income, education. There are differences between rural populations and urban populations. Rural populations are often more resilient, have more chance to, to rebound. Um, so all of these factors play out as well, and we'll see an example of that in the case of Tohoku towards the end of this module. Something very, very interesting is no matter where you are, if you're in California, if you're in Tokyo, still very, very few people prepare for a damaging earthquake, even when they're fully aware that they're living in an area where the seismic risk is high. And the social scientists find reasons for this. They have terms for processes that we really understand uh, instinctively ourselves. They call outcome expectancy the notion that we can do very little because the problem is so severe, that we have very little chance, basically, of surviving the next earthquake. And so that is a tendency to force the population into denial and force them away from preparedness. That's kind of a community-wide parameter. There's a parameter which affects us as an individual as well, which is called self-efficacy. That's whether we believe that we can act efficiently or not. And it's, it, 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 it's across all of life. Somebody who believes that they can act effectively in their everyday life will be more likely to prepare and react well for a damaging earthquake or a hurricane or a flood. If you have people in a community with low self-efficacy, they're not going to prepare. And then finally, and this is something which recurs a lot in the context of very frequent events, people have a false expectation that the next event will look like the last event. So that if the last event was survivable, the next event will be as well. So these are things we have to attack. These are things we have to address. Um, my last series of slides relating to the social science of earthquake disasters is a remarkable survey that was done after the Tohoku earthquake in Japan by a group of Japanese uh, researchers. They interviewed a small group of people, but incredibly intensely. And what they found was um, that they were working with a population which was both predominantly male and also a relatively aged population. If you look at the um, chart at the top right of the diagram, you'll see that a quarter of the population were over the age of 70. If we drop down and say what percentage of the population were over the age of 60, it's half the population. And the majority of them were in danger from the earthquake or the tsunami that followed. So 81% of this very aged population needed to do something in a hurry. Warnings were sent. The question is, how did they get warnings? In reality, half the people did not receive warnings. The war warning systems, the warning systems were predicated to operate through television and through out, um, outside uh, networks of loudspeakers and, and um, sirens, but in fact half the population never received a warning. The bulk of them who did received it from um, the wireless um, speaker systems, but traditional media like radio and television played a very minor role. Why was this? It was the loss of electricity. Electricity was lost, communication channels were lost. Not surprisingly, you then saw 
quite a diverse response um, from the community. They asked two sets of questions. One was, what was your fate after the event? And this is covered in the right-hand diagram. The other one was, what caused you to evacuate? What influenced your decision? What it shows is about a third of the population evacuated safety and were not impacted at all by either the earthquake or the tsunami. But the rest of the pop and 17% of the population were in a safe place anyway. The other 50% range from being exposed to slight danger right through to being physically caught. 6% were caught in the tsunami and, and, and survived. But when you look at how the decisions were made, most people who did make a decision to evacuate did so simply because they experienced the ground shaking at the start of the earthquake and knew that they had to take action. About a third of the population reacted to advice from somebody else, and about 20% actually saw the tsunami. They, they, they stayed in situ through the earthquake, but then saw the tsunami and reacted. This is remarkable. This is an incredibly low percentage of people reacting to official warnings. Once the earthquake stopped, or at least the shaking died away, people reacted in a range of different ways. About a third immediately evacuated. Um, about a quarter, however, started to do checks on safety of family members. And this is a critical issue. If people believe their family are not safe, they're not going to react to increase their own chances of survival. People spent time clearing up the, the earthquake damage, picking up objects off the floor. They spent time talking to each other. Some of them prepared for evacuation. Some of them were even went down to watch for a tsunami. So approximately half of the population did things which did nothing to help them whatsoever. So then the scientists went through an elaborate explanation of what the factors were that caused um, the these issues, these problems. And their analysis was that there were four factors that played out, four factors which, which, which I've listed here. And I'll only talk about the uh, first two of them in any detail. But the third one relates to the fact that the Japanese community has seen many, many tsunami warnings without dangerous tsunamis in the last 30 years. This lulled people into a false sense of security. This was this normalization problem of thinking that the next tsunami would be like the last. And then people put undue trust in the tsunami walls, the tsunami structures. But the other two factors were more important, and if we look at these progressively, the forecast was wrong. The worst case scenario was not based on, for example, a one in 500 year event. It was based on more like a one in 100 year event. As a consequence, all the planning, all the strategy for reaction was predicated on inundation zones from the tsunami that followed the earthquake, which were much too small. Most of the shelters for people to evacuate to were actually within the inundation zone because the assumption was inundation would not be that great. And so people had to move more than once. They had to go to shelters and then evacuate again if they were to survive. And then the problems with the warning system. Only 10% of people in Japan listen to radio. Most people watch television. Television communication was lost immediately on um, the arrival of the earthquake. The warning was operated, was also sent out via the loudspeaker system outdoors, but many people stayed indoors and were unaware. So that coupled with the fact that when the warning did come out, they misjudged the size of the earthquake and the size of the tsunami, led to a large number of people simply not evacuating whatsoever. So we're really coming to the end of this module, and I wanted to start summing up by looking at the size of some of our recent damaging earthquakes. So those last few slides related to Tohoku, a magnitude nine earthquake, relatively deep earthquake, but it ripped a very large scar across the landscape. Put that in context, a year earlier at Haiti, the Haiti earthquake was a fraction the size of the Tohoku one, but much, much shallower. 
Sai Chan in China, between the two in terms of magnitude, between the two in terms of the rupture, but again a relatively shallow earthquake. Kobe, with its fifth floor problem, was only verging on a magnitude 7 earthquake. So very, very comparable in size to Haiti uh, and a little bit deeper. Northridge in California, which I refer to as a contrast to Haiti because they're both close to magnitude 7 earthquakes. And then finally the Christchurch earthquake with our opening video. So if we take these six, there are different characteristics, different dimensions of those earthquakes just in physical terms. But when we look at them in social terms, in terms of the cost to the civilian population, very, very different consequences. I've summarized it here in terms of the death toll, and the death toll ranges from 316,000 in Haiti for a magnitude seven, um, up, uh, sorry, down to a death toll of 60 in the context of, of the North Ridge earthquake of almost comparable size. I've also put in the number of injured, and then the, the dollar cost. And the dollar cost, again, varies remarkably between the different events and, of course, the cost versus GDP. There's actually a decoupling between the magnitude of the earthquake and its human cost and its dollar cost. So this is the plot here with the number of deaths recorded from earthquakes plotted against the magnitude of the earthquakes. And what you see there is a fairly steady line from magnitude 6 to magnitude 9 with a gentle upscaling from Christchurch to Taoku and then Haiti is just way off the trend. It's an outlier, a spectacular outlier. It's the same for, do for the loss. If you look here, there's broadly a trend, I guess, running from Christchurch through certainly to Sai Chan. Uh, and then Kobe and maybe Taho, Tahoku both sit well above the line. So again, there has to be a reason for this. There has to be something which explains this. And what it is, of course, is purely and simply the societal influence. And Haiti, no building standards led to, no, no, no rigorously enforced building codes led to dramatic increase in loss and life. In Kobe, the lack of retrofitting of the old buildings contributed hugely to the, the dollar cost. Then Tahoku, it was the, the bulk of the dollar cost was in fact the cascading hazard of the, of the tsunami superimposed on top. So it's not a simple matter of evaluating what the level of risk is based simply on what we know about earthquakes. Um, in terms of comparing Northridge to Haiti again, well, this is the, the striking comparison that it's completely unreasonable to assume that if a country is already in a state of crisis, that it will cope well with the superimposed issues of an earthquake. Um, the two order of magnitude contrast in income between the United States and Haiti, for example, the contrast in terms of how much of the ground is forested versus defoliated, these things are what contribute and determine that Haiti was a major disaster and Northridge was uh, comparatively minor. This is my final slide, and this is a slide directed specifically at you, at people who are emergency managers and at first responders. This is returning to Kobe, the uh, city with the fifth floor problem. Um, it's when a major city is impacted by a major disaster, it's impossible to detect, detach first responders and emergency managers from the rest of the community and to treat them as somewhat, somewhat different. In Kobe, it was estimated after the event, some 40% of the city employees were victims of the earthquake and only 20% of the workers were available to respond the following day. The other 80% had either lost their lives or were locked in a situation where they were trying desperately to re-establish some, some part of their life. So this is something we have to remember. We have to consider this in the context of setting into place a resilient framework, a structure which permits 
first responders to be victims as well, because otherwise um, the, the recipe is, is truly disastrous.